Thanks for that, Jonathan. I was like, I would use the Sterling table. I'm very excited to be back here at Milk. It's been a long time since I've been here in person. Do you know that the other campuses view you as the cool campus? Do you know that? You're the fun campus? Well, you are. It's good to be here. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Jeff Frazier. I'm the lead pastor of uh, Chapel Street Church, and you probably know Sterling because he's here most of the time, but it's a privilege for me to be here. Um, let's begin with a little hypothetical, question, a hypothetical scenario and a question. The scenario I think will be familiar to most of you. So here's the scene. You're in the checkout line at Walmart, Target, with whichever kind of person you are. There's a difference, I'm, I'm told. I'm more of a Walmart person, but whatever. <laughs> you're in the checkout line, you put all your items on the belt, and uh, somebody behind you taps you on the shoulder and you turn and they ask you to hand to them one of those little dividing sticks, you know, that divides up the purchases. And so you reach and grab that, you turn and you're going to hand it to them. Okay, that's the scene, right? Pretty common. Now, here's the question. I want you to watch the screen and as the images roll, I want you to imagine that the people you see on the screen, that that's the person behind you asking for the dividing line, dividing stick. And your question is this. Which ones are you more likely to talk to? say hello to, smile at, engage with, and which ones might give you pause. All right, ready? Let's do this together. Okay, one more image, and this one I will warn you a bit is a little disturbing. So I just want to prepare you. You can show that image. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. If you don't know who this is, this is Pastor Brian Coffey with the mustache. <laughs> all, all kidding aside, though, what was going on in your mind and in your heart when you saw those images? I'm guessing, if you're honest, I mean, you knew what I was probably getting at, so you tried not to do this, but we all do our own inner profiling, don't we? We're making little judgments, telling ourselves little stories about what that person must be like. Now, we're in the third week of our series in the book of James. It's a letter James wrote to Christians, churches scattered around the Roman world because they're fleeing out of persecution. James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes this letter to encourage them, to challenge them. And last week, we talked about how, um, what it means to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And that's really the heart of what James is getting at. James's issue, what well, his concern, he's not... James spends very little time, like Paul, talking about the ins and outs of the gospel. He doesn't get into doctrinal detail. He sort of assumes you know that and believe that. His concern is, okay, you, what should your life look like if you really believe this? How should you behave? That's why we call it street-level faith. What should it look like in your home, on your street, in your neighborhood, in your heart, the way you interact at the grocery store, in the checkout line, if you really believe this? How should it impact your life? So let's look at James 1, 27 through 2, 13. That'll be enough for us to chew on this morning. James 1, 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their, their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now there's a lot in there. But he begins by talking about what's, what's genuine religion look like. Now, this is one of the few places the word religion is used in the New Testament to talk about our faith. We often will say, it's not a religion, it's a relationship with Jesus, and that's true. When he talks about religion, what he's saying is this. What does authentic faith look like? And he's say, making a distinction between going through the motions, religious forms, jumping through the hoops, doing the traditions, the rituals, versus how you treat people. What good is it if you do all the right stuff religiously, but you still judge and treat people differently? That's what James is driving at. What does true religion look like? What does it really look like at the street level faith? It has everything to do with how you treat people. Then uh, I want you to see at the beginning of chapter two, he raises a problem for us, the problem of partiality. Now partiality, you might say favoritism. It doesn't sound like that big a deal. I mean, it's probably not good to play favorites, But it's not like, you know, murder or adultery. But James compares them. Did you catch that? Partiality doesn't sound like a big deal, but James calls it sin and connects it to the big ones. Murder and adultery. He's trying to get us to see something very, very important here. It's a reference to, in verse 4 he says, aren't you become judges with evil thoughts? It's a reference in that culture to judges who took bribes. In other words, this is an issue of justice. You're being unjust. And this has no place in the family of God, he's saying. Just doesn't belong here. He's talking about prejudice and discrimination and the ranking system we do in our minds and our hearts. That does not belong in the community of faith, he says. And then he gives us three reasons why, and I'll walk through them. First, he basically says, it's, it steals God's glory. What does he mean there? Look at verse 1 of chapter 2 again. My beloved brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. James only mentions Jesus' names three times in, three times in his letter. This is one of the times, and he, we should pay attention, he calls him the Lord of glory. That's a specific title. What does he mean? What he's saying is this, basically this. There's Jesus, the Lord of glory, and there's everybody else. Right? There's the Lord of glory, and then there's the rest of us. But we live in a culture that's ranking people all the time. And you were doing it a moment ago, weren't you? I know you were think, trying not to because you knew what I was getting at, right? But you were doing it. How many of you thought, Chip and Joanna Gaines, oh, I'd love to talk to them. I'd be too nervous, though. Right? <laughs> Some of you are like, they, they sell their stuff, right? Target or Walmart, they're, 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 they're like daffodil farms, whatever it's called. What is it? Yeah, you're like, don't call it this. I know, I know what it is. My wife tells me. <laughs> my point is, like, we rank people. My, wa- my wife and daughter's favorite baseball player, Chris Bryant, oh, if he was in the checkout line next to me, right? We, we do this sort of thing. James, what he's saying here is this. To the degree that you see Jesus as the Lord of glory, you'll see other people as equals. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, God says, I'm the Lord. There's no other. I don't share my glory. I don't give my glory out to anybody else. Nor my praise to false idols. When, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's wrong to respect someone or admire somebody. That's fine. But there's a big difference between respect and admiration and the prejudiced distinctions we make in our heart. The ranking, inner inner profiling we do in our mind and heart. And when you rank somebody else over another person, when you show partiality or favoritism to one person over another for whatever reason, you're actually robbing God of glory because you're ascribing it in the wrong place. That's what he's getting at. When you see Jesus as the Lord of glory, you begin to see everybody else differently. The second reason he gives us for this is that it violates God's law. Just says it very distinctly. It violates God's law. David Platt, some of you might know him. He's a Christian author and pastor. He wrote a book called Radical. Perhaps you've heard of that or read that. In his commentary on the book of James, he writes this. I am convinced that the deep, dark secret of our religious subculture in America is that we want Christianity. We want the church on our terms, according to our preferences and in alignment with our lifestyles. And I think he's dead on. And I'm guilty of it too. We want church and religion and Christianity on our terms. But James is very clear here. God defines what true religion is, what real faith looks like, not us. 
He decides. He determines it. Let me read verses 8 and 9 again of chapter 2 for you. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. I mean, it couldn't be, I don't have to like unpack that. That's pretty clear, right? If you follow the law, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're guilty of breaking all of it. You're sinning. When he calls it the royal law, I think that's intentional. He's saying, he's implying we have a king. Jesus, we sing about Jesus our king, right? But do we mean that? He's our king. He has rightful claim over our life. We are his subjects. We're under his reign and rule. But do we live that way? Let me ask this question again. Who are you predisposed to show partiality to? Who are your kind of people? Maybe they're all sitting next to you. Who are you predisposed to be biased against? Who do you view as, well, they are the real problem in our country today? What James is saying is that has no, just doesn't have any place. If you see Jesus right and you see yourself right, that has no place in God's family. And it's as bad in God's eyes as murder and adultery. It's right up there. The second reason I told you is that it violates God's law, and then James uses this one phrase of the royal law, and then he uses the phrase, loving your neighbor as yourself. And that is the same phrase Jesus uses in Matthew 22 when he's asked by the an expert in the law, sum it up for it, Jesus, break it down for it, Jesus. What's all these law and all the commands, like give us the, what's it come down to? And he says two things, and they're inseparable. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love people. All the law and the prophets, they all, everything else hangs on those two commandments. And they cannot be separated, right? They go int- intimately together. Love God, love people, all people. This is crucial. And by the way, James is not just drawing on Jesus' statement. He's going all the way back to the Old Testament, the Levitical law, Leviticus chapter 19. But it would be helpful to us to look at the context in which this command is given. Verses 15 through 18. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness judge your neighbor, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your own people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. He keeps saying I am the Lord to impress what James is saying. God decides what genuine faith looks like. What does it look like? Love your neighbors yourself. We talk about being the neighborhood church, a family of neighborhood churches. That's why, by the way, Mill Creek exists in in part of God's vision for us. That's why some of you are here, to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's your neighbor? Well, Jesus taught a whole parable about that, but we don't have time to get into that in detail. So it violates God's law. James seems to anticipate us an objection we might have. Like you might be thinking, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. I should, I, I, sh- I probably play favorites, and I probably am not as fair as I ought to be, but that's not the same thing as murder or cheating on my spouse. Actually, that's exactly what James says in verse 10. Finally, the third reason he gives us is that it dishonors God's children. It dishonors God's children. James gives a fascinating little hypothetical situation, doesn't he? So it's like, imagine that you're at church. He calls it the gathering. This is the f- reference to the early church gathering together, usually in homes and under persecution. And two people walk in. Sounds like the start of a bad joke. One j- looking sharp, looking good. Somebody complimented my jacket today. Thank you. I'm feeling, looking good, right? You're looking sharp today at church. This person obviously has their act together. Hey, come right over here. Get to know you. What's your name? So glad you're here. Somebody else walks in, and they don't look so good. Maybe they look like they slept under a park bench. Maybe they don't smell so good. Maybe it's very obvious that they're coming from a different socioeconomic demographic, and you don't greet him at all or dismiss them. There's this, Mahatma Gandhi tells a story about how he was reading the Sermon on the Mount and was captivated by Jesus' teachings, and he went to a church, the only Christian church that was nearby that he knew of, run by white colonialists from England. And he went in, and they greeted him at the door and told him, the Christian church service for your people is down the street. And he went home and thought, well, if Christians have a caste system like Hindus, why should I change? There's no difference. James is, one of the things he's implying here is that you want to stand out in the world, you want to look different in the world, you want to make a difference in the world. It isn't Facebook posts, it isn't marching and protesting, it's start treating people as if they're all brothers and sisters. Make no distinctions. 
Stop ranking and being partial and discriminatory. That will stand out in the world. That's unusual. That's countercultural. It dishonors God's children, he says. Let me read verses 5 and 6 again. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Now, he's not saying that the rich are categorically bad and the poor are categorically good. He's talking about the distinctions we make based on externals. He's saying, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. God chose the weak things, the poor things, the foolish things of the world to shame the strong and the wise. This is how the gospel works. In other words, the gospel reverses our status in the world and it transforms our standards in the world. At least it should. So let's talk then about the power to be impartial. Now just as an aside for a minute, when we talk about uh, being impartial, making no distinctions, we're really saying that every person has value and dignity and worth in the eyes of God, right? And you get that. That's in our Constitution, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are endowed with these inalienable rights by their Creator. We understand that. that. That seems like common sense in our culture. We don't always behave that way, but you probably get that instantly. But where did that idea come from? Where did the idea of universal human rights and dignity come from? It's not, by the way, common sense, historically speaking. Most civilizations and cultures in human history have not had that view. They have not thought that or behaved that way or passed laws that way. Aristotle, pretty smart guy, what, what was, it, was it Princess Bride where he says, Socrates, Aristotle, morons, right? <laughs> if you haven't seen the movie, I apologize. He says, Aristotle once said, when you closely examine the different groupings of humanity, you discover clearly that some are born to be slaves. That was common law. That was common sense in his day, in other words. Most civilizations and cultures throughout human history did not have the view that individuals had universal rights and dignity. This idea is rooted in the biblical teaching of the image of God, the Imago Dei. It comes out of the Judeo-Christian ethic. Let me read to you a quote by Martin Luther King Jr., a sermon he gave in 1965 at his home, Ebenezer Baptist Church. He said, you see, the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of the Imago Dei is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. And this gives them uniqueness. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a base black, is significant on God's keyboard. I love that. Precisely because every man is made in the image of God. And one day we'll learn that. We'll know one day that God made us to live together as brothers and sisters and to respect the dignity and the worth of every man. He's drawing on not political documents, not even the founding of our nation. He's saying even the founders of our nation understood something that goes way back. But this has not always been true in human history. Brian Tierney, professor of history at Cornell University, specializes in the development of Western philosophical and political thought. Here's what he writes. The idea of natural human rights, which is now dominant in Western societies, developed out of specifically Christian ideas and how those Christian concepts influenced jurists and lawmakers in the early Middle Ages. Prior to this, the idea of universal human rights was not universal at all. And last quote, David Bentley Hart, a great sociologist and philosopher, writes this. We must not forget where our contemporary Western society's larger notions of the moral good come from. Compassion, equality, charity, as we understand them, have not always been around. We should acknowledge that we are the inheritors of a social conscience whose ethical grammar would have been vastly different had it not been shaped by Christianity. Here's the problem, though. There, these are even secular scholars saying there's no getting around the fact that the idea of universal human dignity and rights and value comes out of Christian teachings, biblical worldview. Where we're living in a society that demands human rights and dignity, but we've totally cut ourselves off from the soil in which these things grew, the root, right? We want rights and dignity for every person, but we're, we have, we've left the foundation on which those things stand. How many of you heard of a, a philosopher and teacher named Jordan Peterson? Very popular these days, anybody? This is just me? You should read more. I'm only kidding. Right? Jordan Peterson's Canadian, and uh, he's uh, famous. He's kind of agnostic, but he appreciates the Judeo-Christian ethic for its philosophical teachings. He even acknowledges, I don't think these th this is tenable. Basically, he says, I'm not, I'm not, he's not necessarily saying I believe in Jesus, 
but he's saying, I don't think you can have a society that has un the uniqueness and human dignity and rights if we leave the foundation on which they're built. This is what Nietzsche meant when he said God is dead. He wasn't celebrating. He's saying we've left something behind and it's going to cost us. Okay, but I'm off the subject, which tends to happen. So we're, that's society as a whole. Okay, we get that. Society as a whole, I understand that. What about you? What about me? This is really James' point, right? He's really getting at what does it look like in my life, how I treat people. And to talk, to answer this question, this is, I'm going to just take you to a story of Jesus. What better place to go? And I'm going to set the stage for you here. This, the story here, and I don't have time to read all of it, and it's really, I would encourage you to go read it all, but Jesus gets invited in, in Luke chapter 7 over to a religious leader's house. The guy's name is Simon. He gets invited over for dinner. And at the dinner party, Simon, the, the Pharisee, the religious leader in town, intentionally disrespects and snubs Jesus. He does not kiss him, which would be a typical sign of respect for an honored guest. He does not anoint his head with oil. Now, we might excuse him that those are in, uh, unintentional oversights, although I don't think so. But he doesn't even wash his feet or give him water for washing or have a servant wash him. This is clearly an intentional slight. So he's not inviting Jesus over to honor him, but to sort of expose him as a fraud. You get the picture? During dinner, a woman enters the dinner party. Now, you might be thinking, how did she get in the house? It's not like you're thinking. It's an open courtyard, a three-sided home, and they would have been eating outside in that courtyard, and people from the town would gather around to listen to the pearls of wisdom dropping from these religious leaders and philosophers' lips as they ate. This was common. The woman's in the crowd, and she approaches Jesus at his feet, and she's weeping, the Bible says, and wetting, weeping so much that Jesus' feet get wet, and she wipes them off with her hair, and then she pours perfume on his feet. Now, she's not under the table when he's eating, like you might be thinking in our culture. Jesus would have been at a Middle Eastern table, reclining on his right elbow with his feet stretched out behind him on, a, on like a cushion in his elbow. So she's behind him. Everyone can see her. Simon, the one who invited Jesus over, sees the whole thing happening and judges Jesus and the woman in his heart. And he basically says in his heart, see, I knew it. No self-respecting rabbi would let a sinful woman touch him, especially not a woman like this in public. Okay, in that context, Jesus tells a story. And he tells the story he, to answer Simon's thoughts, which is so cool of Jesus. So Simon's thinking this stuff, and Jesus answers him out loud. Okay, let's read verses 41 through 47 of Luke 7. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom the, he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time that I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Oh, there's so much in there. I wish we had another hour to talk about this, but we don't. That question, I want you to hear that question. Do you see this woman? It's the most profound question in the whole story there. Do you see this woman? Now, Jesus, it says, he turns to the woman. So he has to raise up and look behind him at the woman. But he's talking to Simon. So he's looking at the woman. Do you see this woman? And of course, Simon physically sees her. He's aware she's in the room. He sees her with his eyes. But he doesn't really see her, does he? He totally misses her. In fact, Simon doesn't see much at all. The Son of God is at his dinner party. He doesn't see him accurately. He doesn't see the woman the way God sees her. He doesn't even see himself accurately, which is the point of the little story Jesus told. I don't know if you got that point. Two men owe money. Five, 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 50 denari a denarii is a day's wage. 50 days wages or 500 day, days wages. So it's a lot of money. Neither one can pay. So he cancels the debt of both. Now, which one will love him more? And Simon's like, well, doesn't want, he doesn't want to answer because he knows where this is going. Well, I suppose the one with the bigger debt canceled. Jesus says, bingo. He doesn't say bingo. He says, you judged rightly. But Simon doesn't get it. The question, do you see this woman, is predicated on a, another question which is implied. Do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a small debtor? Do you see yourself as the one who only owes 50? I mean, I'm not perfect. But compared to the rest of you poor people, I'm, God's getting a pretty good deal when it comes to me. I mean, look around. I don't do what that guy does. I don't like that way. You should see my, my brother-in-law acts, right? I'm a pretty good guy. We, you do this. We do this. But what's the point of the story? 
50 or 500, neither one could pay. Ah. 50, 500, 5 million, what does it matter if you can't pay? If you can't pay, you can't pay. Do you see yourself as one who only owes a little bit, only, only needs a little bit of grace? Or do you see yourself as one who owes a debt you could never pay? You just could never pay. But it's been paid. That's the gospel, friends. That's the gospel. You owe a, you're in over your head. You owe a debt you can't pay. Could never work it off. But God loves you, and he paid it. When that gets inside of you, how could you look at somebody else and think, well, I'm better than them. Well, that person. It just has no place. It just it violates every principle of the gospel. And I'm speaking to myself here. I mean, I chose the pictures, but I'm doing the same thing. Ranking people, judging people, even if I don't act outwardly about that. Because when James says, talks about treating people, what he's really say, talking about is seeing people. How you treat people has everything to do with how you see them, doesn't it? I mean, you might be able to clean up your act and behave okay. But how you treat people ultimately speaks to what you, how you see them. And how you see them speaks to how you see yourself. And how you see yourself speaks to how you see Jesus, the Lord of glory. You get it? How you treat people talks about how you see people. How you see people means how do you see yourself. And you only see yourself accurately in light of being the, lar- the debtor who can't pay. That Jesus paid for you. That's why James is saying, there's the Lord of glory who paid all of our debts, and then there's the rest of us on level ground. There's no difference. There's no distinction. There are no small debtors in God's kingdom. There's only those of us who think we are. And we're in the worst situation of all. This is the point he's making, by the way, to get back on point. In, in James, the end of this little section in James chapter 2, This is the triumph of mercy. The triumph of mercy. Verses 12 and 13. Which I don't think I ever really paid attention to or understood, but they're just really beautiful when you see them in this context. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. That's James's phrase for the gospel, the law of liberty. Speak and act like those people who get this, who see accurately. For judgment is without mercy for the one who has shown no mercy. This is what Jesus said. He who's been forgiven little loves little. This is Simon's issue, right? There's a big sin at the dinner party, and it's not the woman. It's Simon's heart. It's eyes that won't weep. It's hands that won't serve. It's knees that won't kneel, and it's a heart that's too proud and stubborn to love. That's the issue. That's what he says. There's no mercy. There's judgment without mercy for those who show no mercy because you, you have not experienced it. But the last line, the last line is, if you're an underliner, a highlighter, highlight, circle, star, smiley face, the last line. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What a great statement. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you get Jesus, it has in your life. His mercy and grace. You're guilty. You're sinful. You're deserving of judgment. But his mercy triumphs over that. Isn't that good news? So let that mercy triumph over judgment of your own heart. Let mercy triumph triumph over the judgment that you have of other people because you see yourself accurately and you see them the way god sees them or at least you're trying to there's no this is the this is the this is the whole deal friends and i think about our culture and i was going to say something about this but well i guess i will you know you look on social media every other week or month there's a new thing to be outraged about that's terrible in our culture that people are taking positions on politically and the most recent one is the separation of families, children from their parents at the border, our southern borders. And it's hard to know what's what. You read stuff online, you don't, you don't know what's fake news, what's real news, and people have political opinions and they get all twisted up about their political convictions. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about love. I'm talking about as Christians who are under the, the reign of the Lord of glory and who see all people as deserving of his mercy and in need of his grace, just like I am, how can we not care about that? Now, I'm not smart enough to make policies that fix the border issues. What I'm talking about is it's, there's no gray area where it comes to my heart on that. And there shouldn't be in ours either. Now, I can't drive down there and fix that problem. But I can fix the one next door. I can fix the one in my own heart. I can surrender myself to the Lord of glory and start loving my neighbors down the street from me. This is what James is saying. Show no partiality. Because when you do, it just, all it does is, is it betrays the fact that you don't understand the gospel. 
You don't know what's been paid for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing phrase that mercy triumphs over judgment. We praise you that that's true in our own hearts. Your mercy has triumphed over the judgment we deserve. Let it also triumph over the judgmentalism of our hearts. Help us to see people the way you see them, to see ourselves as debtors who could never pay, but were loved so much that you paid it all. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.